Welcome everyone. If this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to the channel. Here in this channel I upload every single evening the latest horror stories. Please leave a like before we get started. It really helps the channel and it shows your support. Please could we get over 1000. Let's begin. November 12th. The house was filled with the scent of Lisa's mum's homemade lasagna wafting from the kitchen. Lisa was laying on the couch with her legs stretched out, a textbook open on her lap, but her eyes weren't on the page. They were glued to her phone, fingers flying across the screen as she scrolled through Instagram. Okay, seriously, why do people post these things? She said tossing her phone onto the coffee table. They're literally complaining about the exact same things they're doing. I nodded my eyes, still glued to Lisa's laptop. We'd just gotten back from soccer practice, the familiar ache of exertion settling into my legs, and now, as always, we're indulging in the comfortable routine of post-practice chill time at Lisa's house. Lisa was clicking through a YouTube video about makeup tips when I noticed a tab in her browser history. Craigslist. I asked, You were browsing Craigslist? Lisa, still giggling at something on her phone, mumbled non-committally. Maybe. I can't remember. I tapped the tab. It was listing. Not for anything specific, just a single picture a small, carved wooden box. The ad read, Purchase at your own discretion. What in the world is this? I asked. Lisa's laughter died in her throat. She came over to me to figure out what I was actually going on about, as she knew at this point that I was being serious. She leaned closer and looked. Um, I don't remember looking at that. I don't know. Maybe I saw it earlier and just forgot. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Really weird. But, I mean, Craigslist is just full of weird stuff. The listing was only $30. Do you want to buy it? I asked. Lisa didn't answer immediately. There was a long, heavy silence. Uh, why? She finally said. It feels wrong, you know. But at the same time, I'm really curious about what's in the box. I knew the feeling, the fascination and the pull towards the unknown. And against our better judgement, against the fear in our gut, we decided to buy it. Lisa entered her address, and I, feeling like I was pushing through a thin membrane of sanity, clicked the send payment button. The box arrived at Lisa's house a week later, delivered anonymously by delivery service. It was a small, heavy, and wrapped in brown paper. There was no name or address on the package. Lisa and I exchanged a nervous look at each other. The weight of what we had done was hitting us like a cold wave. As we opened it, inside the box was a single handwritten note on a piece of paper, the paper was lined and seemed to be A4. You have been chosen. Uh, what's this all about, Lisa? I turn and ask her. Something told me to just scrunch up the note and throw it in the trash. But there was something strange about all this. It was clearly just a prank, and neither me or Lisa were taking it seriously. December 1st. The weeks that followed were just a whole bunch of routine, and then something struck. Nothing overtly alarming, but it was just a constant undercurrent of weird things. So Lisa started finding small notes tucked into her locker at school, scribbled on scraps of paper. Each one was offering a different but equally unsettling message. Thank you for purchasing the box. You are watched. You are not alone. We are closer than you think. 
Her parents started receiving anonymous phone calls, strange silent calls that would abruptly disconnect after a few rings. The voicemails they received were filled with static, punctuated by the faint distorted sound of some rummaging that we can't really make sense of. It was enough to make them jumpy, paranoid, but never enough to pinpoint a definite threat. Our initial fear had turned into a simmering anxiety, where the whole family was now aware. For some reason, I wasn't in any of this, but instead, the seller was now causing a nightmare for Lisa and her entire family. January 15th. Lisa and I were at her house again, studying for upcoming finals. We hadn't been able to think about what we were actually going to do that evening, because we were so worried that something bad was about to happen. Either a phone call, another letter, a weird behaviour from one of the neighbours. The list was never ending. Suddenly, the doorbell rang. Lisa jumped, her hand flying to her throat. We both froze. Nobody visited Lisa's family, especially not on a Tuesday night. Lisa took a shaky breath, trying to appear calm. I'll get it, she said. She peeked through the peephole and her face went white. It's a man, she stammered. He's holding a box. A box? I asked. What kind of box? A small one? Like a wooden box, like the one we bought. We didn't even need to look at each other. We both knew what that box contained. It was just going to be another note, and this man on her front doorstep was in on it. Lisa took another shaky breath, then opened the door a crack, with the chain still across. A man, his face obscured by a mask, a surgical mask, stood on the doorstep. He was holding a small wooden box wrapped in brown paper. This is for you, he said. He tried to shove the box between the gap of the door and the system, but because Lisa hadn't done the chain on, he was now struggling to get it through. Frustrated, the man cussed, took a few steps back, and put the wooden box on the doorstep. Lisa shut the door and put the deadbolts across, until the man got into his car and drove away. We were both idiots not to get his license tags. After he left, she went and got the box from the doorstep. We both stood there, frozen, the box clutched in her hand. We both knew that we couldn't ignore this anymore. This was more than just creepy notes. This was something else. Something that had become dangerous. February 2nd. The box was filled with photos. Photos of Lisa, of her family, of our soccer team and of me. They weren't just snapshots, they were meticulously staged, capturing moments from our lives that were supposedly private. Moments that we never shared with anyone outside our circle. On the back of each photo was a short handwritten message, a chilling reminder of the invisible presence of this group that was now watching our lives 24-7. Not only were they watching it, they were documenting it, photographing it, and seemingly interrupting it. We were always watching you, the note read. Lisa was horrified, and at this point I remember her breaking down into tears in her front living room. Her family was shaken to the core. Their initial disbelief was replaced by fear, and the police were finally called. The police deemed the photo was as harmless, brushing off our concerns as mere teenage paranoia, saying that it was someone from our school playing a prank, and it was just a joke that would no doubt go away. The fear that had been coming up inside of us was a fear that told us that this wasn't a joke or a prank. We knew we weren't dealing with a prank. This was something insidious, something relentless, and something that was slowly tightening its grip around us. March 1st. 
The harassment intensified. Our phones started receiving anonymous calls almost daily. Each one was a different voice, all male, a different tone, and a different level of disgusting. I can't even explain it. Some were filled with virtual, others with chillingly quiet threats. Lisa's friends started reporting seeing strange cars parked outside of their houses, cars that would quickly drive off when they were noticed. Lisa's parents found strained objects left on their doorstep, a single withered rose, a cracked porcelain doll, a small metallic object that looked like a key but was too small to fit in any lock. The messages continued, You can't escape us. We know where you are. We know everything about you. During these times, sleep became a luxury. April 1st. Lisa started to see the man from the doorstep again. He would appear in the strangest places, at the grocery store, the library, even in the park nearby when she was walking her dog with her father. Each time he would simply watch her from a distance, his expression would be unreadable, and the majority of the time he would still be wearing that silly surgical mask. We tried to stay strong, to convince ourselves it was just a coincidence, or a plank, like the police said. Our days were filled with fear, a sense of danger, and each interaction being a potential trap. We became reclusive, avoiding public spaces and taking too many days off school. We started staying in our homes, but even there we felt unsafe. The feeling of being watched never really left either of us, and it was all because of that stupid purchase I made on Craigslist. May 1st. It was a Friday night and Lisa and I were at her house again, trying to enjoy a movie night. Her family had invested in extra security, including cameras, extra locks, deadbolts, chains, and even bars on the windows, which to be honest, even I thought was a bit excessive. We were both exhausted. Anxiety and panic attacks make you feel so drained. Your adrenaline shoots up, and then it shoots down, through the floor. It was basically impossible to relax, to let go, listening to podcasts, my favourite music, or watching films, nothing worked. While we were watching our movie, out of nowhere the power went out. The house was in darkness, and the only light was coming from the screen of Lisa's laptop. Lisa started screaming in a paranoid way. <laughs> Holy S, it's them again. They're here. I tried to calm her down. We could hear footsteps approaching, and they were slow and deliberate, coming from the direction of her front door. We had no idea what was going on. June 1st. The footsteps at her front door were never explained. The camera picked nothing up, and they didn't leave another wooden box or a note. The police called once again, found nothing, dismissing any connection to the previous incidents saying that the power going out was a short circuit, or a jump in the system, whatever that's supposed to mean. The harassment didn't stop. It continued, escalated, becoming more personal and more intrusive. It became more terrifying. Someone started leaking information about Lisa and her family to the local newspaper, a smear campaign designed to isolate them to tarnish their reputation, to make them seem like they were responsible for the harassment. We felt like we were drowning. July 1st. We spent the summer in a state of perpetual nervous breakdown. Every phone call, every knock at the door, sent chills down our spines. We lived in constant fear. The police continued to be unhelpful, dismissing our concerns as exaggerated and hallucinations. We were desperate, alone, and terrified. The only thing the police took seriously were the threats over the phone call, which were all just hearsay as none of the calls were recorded. August 1st. 
One day, Lisa found a small handwritten note pinned to her locker at school. You made a mistake. You opened a door you shouldn't have. This note, more than any other, felt like a turning point. This was a chillingly clear threat, a direct consequence of our actions purchasing that box. We had opened a door, a Pandora's box, and now we were trapped inside with no way out. September 1st, we were drowning in despair. The harassment had become relentless, intrusive, and terrifyingly personal. The authorities continued to dismiss us, saying that we needed to record all the threats, and without that, they wouldn't be able to do anything. They were treating our pleas as ramblings of teenagers, and that's even how they quoted it. We felt like we were invisible, our voices were unheard, and our cries for help were falling on deaf ears. October 1st, Lisa's family decided that was it. Enough was enough, they decided to move. They were tired, drained and terrified. They felt like they had lost everything, their home, their peace and their sense of security. They left in the middle of the night, leaving behind a life filled with memories and a future filled with uncertainty. We were left alone, two young women who had made a mistake. A mistake that had shattered their family's life, it had turned their world upside down, and left them with a fear that would haunt them most likely for the rest of their life. November 12th. It's a year since we bought the box, a year since our lives were changed. Finally, the harassment has subsided, the fear has softened, but we'll never forget what happened that night, and for the following months to come. We still don't know who the man was, who sent the box, or who was behind all of the harassment. One thing we do know, it was a mistake. A mistake that we'll forget. Or at least try to. Maybe by the time I reach 80. Yeah. We live with the knowledge that we opened a door. A door that should have remained closed and we pray that nobody else will ever make the same mistake. Okay, I get it. No one was hurt. They were all empty threats, and thinking about it now, it probably was just a stupid prank from a gang or group of silly guys. But, to us and our families, it was a real threat, and we had no idea what they were going to do next. There was a chance they could have tried to kill one of us, abduct us or burn our houses. They didn't do any of that. Instead the threats were all empty and the notes were just a waste of their time and our time. Looking back on it, we have a couple of suspected people that we think it might be, all of which went to our college. They're mostly guys who have way too much spare time and would definitely get a kick out of doing something like this. The weird part is though, it was so intricate that it makes me think only an organized gang would have the time or resources to go into this much detail of our lives. From what me and my sister were doing, to what Lisa and her family were doing, photographs, details about our history and our family, it was all a bit scary, and whoever it was should definitely be hired by the FBI, because I'm telling you, they're good at digging into things and investigating people's lives. May the 2nd, 2017. It's been a surreal and terrifying week. The peace of our suburban neighborhood has been completely and utterly shattered. It did all just boil down to a Craigslist ad. We were looking for a landscaper to spruce up our backyard, and surprisingly, we found a very, very low pricing guy who was willing to do it. The man who responded 
Replace name, Ethan. Seemed friendly and eager. Ethan's first visit went smoothly. He trimmed the hedges, mowed the lawn, and even planted a few new flowers. We were happy with his work, and we paid him tips on top of the salary he was asking for. On his second visit, things started to get awry. I noticed some of our garden tools missing, but I dismissed it as simple oversight. However, when Ethan returned for the third time, my husband David grew suspicious. David had been watching Ethan work from the window, and he saw him pocketing something from our shed. When confronted, Ethan claimed it was his flashlight, but David noticed that it was one of our missing gardening shears. A confrontation ensued, and in a fit of rage, Ethan pulled out a handgun from under his pants. David, who's a former marine, reacted instinctively, drew his own weapon, shots were fired, and before I could even react, I was panicking in my own living room. Ethan fell to the floor, he was crawling for a while, but David managed to disarm him. The police arrived around two minutes later, swarming our property with SWAT and over 15 units. After clearing up and taking Ethan away in the ambulance, the police and the investigators took statements from the neighbours, and me, and also David, who was being arrested and held for questioning. The investigation revealed that Ethan had not been the landscaper he claimed to be, he had used a stolen identity, and was a known thief with a violent past. He had come out of prison after serving six years, then changed his name, and somehow me and David didn't think to look into him. The missing tools and belongings from our neighbours were found in his truck. Yep, I thought our lives had been irrevocably changed by a stranger off Craigslist, and it all just came down to the fact that we trusted him. May the 3rd. The aftermath has been pretty emotional. After David went through questioning and court hearings, he was tried, manslaughter, or for overuse of force. I was grieving for the life lost, anger at the deceit, and fear of what could have happened to our family. The media had descended upon our neighbourhood, turning our private property into a public spectacle. Reporters came outside our house, eager for a morsel of information. The constant sounds of their cameras and the intrusive questions were relentless. May the 4th. David has been withdrawn and somber. He replays the events of that day over and over in his mind, haunted by the possibility of what might have happened if he hadn't have intervened. I tried to comfort him, but the weight of what happened, and the weight of what we've experienced together, does seem unbearable at times. The neighbourhood has rallied around us, offering their support and condolences, which is so sweet. Friends and neighbours have dropped off meals, flowers, cards, and stopped by to give words of encouragement. Their kindness has been a beacon of light during this dark period. May the 5th. Today I ventured out to the backyard. The grass had grown tall and the flowers were wilting. I couldn't help but feel desolate as I looked at the neglected garden. It was a reflection of the experience we had just gone through as a family. I spent the afternoon gardening, pulling up the old weeds and planting new flowers. It was pretty therapeutic, a way to reclaim the space that had been stolen from us. With each seed I planted, there was a glimmer of hope that we could rebuild our lives and find healing in the midst of this chaos. May the 6th. The funeral for Ethan was held today. I didn't attend, but I couldn't stop thinking about his family. They too had been victims in his deception, living a lie built on stolen identities and criminal behaviour. Grief is a strange and unpredictable thing. Sometimes it consumes me completely, other times it retreats into the shadows. 
Today it returned with a vengeance, leaving me feeling lost. May the 7th. The police have closed their investigation, concluding that David acted in self-defence, with reasonable force. It's a relief to have some closure, but the scars of that day will always remain. David is slowly starting to come out of his shell. He's been talking to a therapist and it seems to be helping. I'm hopeful that with time and support, we can both find a way to move forward. May the 8th. Today I received a package in the mail. It was from Ethan's mum. Inside was a heartfelt letter and a small framed photograph of Ethan as a child. She expressed her remorse for her son's actions and asked for our forgiveness, saying that since he turned 15 he had been a changed child. He turned evil and she had no responsibility over him as he left the house unexpectedly. I don't know if I can forgive Ethan, but I understand the mother's pain. She too has been a victim of his deception. I decided to keep the photograph as a reminder of the tragic events that have unfolded. May the 9th The siege of reporters has finally subsided. We're grateful for the return of our privacy, but we still feel vulnerable. The trust we once had in our neighbours has been questioned. David's now seen as a madman who will draw his weapon on any arguments. We've decided to move. This house holds too many painful memories. We need a fresh start, a place where we can heal and create new memories. We packed up our belongings and moved to a different state closer to my parents. The support of our family and even the community where we used to live was extremely unwavering. So, we leave the area behind, seeking a new home, but it's going to be a tough one, as I'm pretty sure David has PTSD after what happened. He confronted a thief, and as a result, the thief tried to kill him. If David hadn't have been armed that day, concealed carrying, he would have been shot dead. There would have been no cover, and there's no way he would have been able to grab or check that gun before Ethan opened fire. Day 1. A distant friend and a Craigslist request. Today I embarked on a nostalgic journey to reconnect with my friend. Our time at Wharton in the lively 1990s was a time that I wished to relive over and over again. As I make my final preparations for our reunion, I'm faced with a pressing concern. The safety of my home while I'm away. With the clock ticking, I turned to Craigslist, hoping to find a responsible and trustworthy house sitter. Amidst the sea of dubious profiles, one listing stood out. A young man claiming to be reliable and experienced, with excellent references and ratings. His profiles seemed to show experience and some of the photos of houses that he had taken care of over the past seven years. Day 2, the house sitter. He arrives at my doorstep, punctual and polite. He's everything his profile promised, friendly, respectful, and seemingly attentive. We go through the details of my home security system, and he assures me that he'll keep a watchful eye over my possessions. As I said goodbye to him and got in my car to head down to my friend, I felt a twinge of unease. The house felt eerily empty and I'd never left it behind before, never for longer than 13 hours. Day 10. Reunion and Relaxation I'm finally reunited with my friend. Our time together is filled with reminiscing, laughter, and a shared desire to relive our youthful days. We attended a party where we catched up with old friends and made new ones. The days pass in a whirlwind of nostalgia and revelry. 
I find myself forgetting the worries of my home. As our time draws to a close, then I started to feel sad. Day 10, the return home. With heavy suitcases and a heart filled with memories, I drive back to my home. As I turn into the driveway, a sickly sweet stench fills my nostrils. I know instantly that something is terribly wrong. This isn't the smell of somebody cooking food, nor is it the smell of some cleaning products or my neighbours washing their claw for the 33rd time this week. I rush to the front door. I unlock it with my spare key and swing the door wide open. A wave of putrid decay enters my nostrils. I stumble into the house and my eyes started to water. I was frantically searching for the source of the smell. My feet lead me to my bedroom, where I find a guy lying motionless in my bed. His eyes open and lifeless, and his body is bloated and discoloured. The smell of decay is overpowering. I started heaving. It was as if his body had been decaying or decomposing for days now. I remember screaming in horror and then just staggering backwards out of the bedroom because I was so unable to believe my own eyes. The house sitter that I'd left my home to was dead in my bed. I rushed to the phone and dialed 911. I remember my voice trembling. This was the most fear and disbelief I had ever felt in my entire life. Day 11. Police Investigation The police arrived promptly and cordoned off the whole scene. As I gave them my statement, I couldn't help but wonder how he had died so suddenly and without warning. He was in his early 30s. The police officers and ambulance speculate that he may have suffered a heart attack or an aneurysm. They take his body away for autopsy, promising to keep me updated on the investigation. Day 17. Autopsy results. The autopsy results are inconclusive. The coroner cannot determine the exact cause of his death, but they ruled out foul play. They speculate he may have had an undetected medical condition that led to his sudden death. I'm left with a haunting question. Why was he found dead in my bed? Had he come into my room and collapsed while looking for something? Or was there something more sinister that occurred? Day 20. I can't bring myself to sleep in that bed. I've changed it over and over and I've even replaced the mattress. The smell of decay is still in my house, but it's very faint since the deep clean. The image of his dead body is seared into my memory. I'll never be able to forget it. I packed my belongings into my car and I drove to a nearby hotel where I stayed for over a month until my savings had gone down to zero. My house feels cursed like it's haunted by his ghost. I fear that I will never be able to return home and feel safe again or be able to get a proper night's sleep. Day 25. Therapy and support. I seek therapy to help me cope with the trauma I've experienced. My therapist suggests that I focus on the positive aspects of my trip and try to let go of the negative. I reach out to my friends and family for support. They offer words of reassurance, reminding me that I'm not alone, and mum and dad offer for me to come and live with them for a couple of months to try and get over it and process everything. Day 30. Moving on. Slowly but surely, I start to rebuild my life. I decide to sell my house and find a new place to live just across the town. It's a difficult decision, but I know that I cannot continue to live in a place that brings back such painful memories. As I pack away my belongings, my home was once a place of joy, but it's now just darkness. Day 90, Embracing the Future with the sale of my house complete, I embarked on a new chapter in my life. I found a charming apartment in the other edge of town in a neighbourhood where I can start fresh. Although I'll never forget what happened, I am determined to try and move on. My thoughts go out to the family of the house sitter, and genuinely, it's more than tragic.
It's Valentine's Day, and I'm cleaning a toilet in a house I've never been to before. Romantic, right? Not the kind of Valentine's Day I would have chosen, mind you. But then again, I'm not the type to choose, not when it comes to work. I'm just a temp, a cog in the ever-spinning wheel of clean sweep, a company that fills the gaps in people's lives with a bit of elbow grease and a whole lot of bleach. The agency had sent me to this address in West Kensington, a detached house with a meticulously manicured lawn and a door knocker shaped like a lion's head. Inside, the air smelled of old money and the faintest hint of lavender. I was paired with a new guy, a skinny kid named Ethan. He had a nervous energy that buzzed around him like a swarm of agitated bees. I tried to ignore him, focusing on my job. I was good at what I did. Not only good, I was damn good. I could make a bathroom sparkle like a freshly polished diamond. The client, Mrs. Lancaster, was a woman in her 70s with silver hair pulled back in the tight bun and eyes that held a glint of steel. She was cordial, but distant. A woman who had seen a lot in her life. A lot she probably didn't want to talk about. My late husband always said, a clean house is a happy house, she said with a small smile. He certainly had good taste, I replied, polishing the antique coffee table in the living room. We finished cleaning by lunchtime, our backs aching but our faces gleaming with the satisfaction of a job well done. Ethan, however, seemed particularly restless. He kept glancing around the living room his eyes flitting from the antique clock to the silver tea set, to the paintings on the wall. My gut told me something wasn't right, but I couldn't put my finger on it. We finished up, and Mrs. Lancaster paid us a crisp 50 pounds each for the three hours of work. We walked out of the house, the afternoon sun warm on our faces. You know, Ethan said, his voice low and conspiratorial, it's a shame we have to clean for these rich folks. They don't even appreciate us. I shrugged, not wanting to get sucked into his negativity. It's a job, Ethan, that's all. He continued, his voice growing louder. You think they'd notice if something disappeared? I stared at him, my stomach churning. Disappeared? What are you talking about? He gave me a sly grin. Let's just say I know a few things about this house that you don't. And some of those things have value. I felt a cold shiver down my spine. This wasn't a disgruntled tempt. This was something darker. Something dangerous. Ethan, please, I said, my voice shaky. Just forget about it. He ignored me, his eyes scanning the street. There's a pawn shop down the block. We could make a quick buck. I felt a surge of anger. I wouldn't be a part of this. Ethan, I'm not going to do this. It's wrong. This is theft. He just laughed. A hollow, 
chilling sound. You're such a goody two-shoes. You'll thank me later when we're rolling in cash. He turned and started walking towards the pawn shop, leaving me standing on the pavement, my heart pounding like a drum. I watched him go, my anger solidifying into a cold fear. February 21st. Ethan didn't come to work today. I was paired with a new guy, a stocky man with a gruff demeanor named Gary. He didn't talk much, but he cleaned with a methodical efficiency I admired. We arrive at Mrs. Lancaster's house, the familiar smell of lavender and old money greeting us at the door. I felt a knot tightening in my stomach. I had to talk to Mrs. Lancaster. I had to tell her about Ethan. But what would I say? That my partner was a thief? A lowlife who was planning to steal from her? What's wrong, love? Gary asked, his eyes narrowed. Nothing, I said, trying to sound casual. Just a bit of headache. We started our work and I tried to ignore the nagging feeling of a niece that wouldn't leave me alone. I scrubbed the bathroom, the kitchen, the living room, my mind racing with the possibilities. When we finished cleaning, Mrs. Lancaster was waiting for us, her face pale and drawn. There's been a theft, she said, her voice trembling. I noticed it this morning. Some of my husband's silver is missing. I felt a wave of nausea wash over me. The knot in my stomach tightened further. I know who did it, I blurted out before I could stop myself. Ethan, the boy who cleaned with me last week. Mrs. Lancaster looked at me. Her eyes filled with disbelief. Are you sure? Why would he do such a thing? I don't know, I said, my voice choked with emotion. But I saw him looking around the house. He was acting strange. He talked about taking things, about selling them. She stood there for a moment, her lips pressed together. Then... She took a deep breath. Thank you for telling me. I'll contact the police. Please do, I said. He needs to be stopped. She nodded, then turned and walked back into the house, leaving me standing alone, my heart heavy with a mixture of relief and fear. February 28th. The police were unable to find Ethan. He's disappeared, vanished without a trace. It was as if he had never existed. Mrs. Lancaster was devastated. She had lost more than just silver. She had lost a part of her past, a connection to her deceased husband. But the worst part was I couldn't shake the feeling that I had somehow failed her. I had known what Ethan was planning, and I had done nothing to stop him. I went back to clean sweep, my head spinning with guilt and shame. You did the right thing, Jane, Sarah, the manager, said, her voice soft but firm. You told the truth. You tried to help. But her words didn't offer me any solace. I still felt responsible, like a stain I couldn't scrub clean. I continued to work, cleaning the houses of strangers, my mind preoccupied with Ethan and Mrs. Lancaster's loss. One day, a few weeks later, I was cleaning a bathroom in a small apartment in Chelsea. 
I was scrubbing the shower, my mind wandering, when I saw a familiar piece of silver tucked away in a drawer. It was a small, intricate silver locket, a family heirloom that I remembered Mrs. Lancaster talking about. It had a little inscription on the back, a date and some initials. My heart pounded in my chest. Ethan had stolen more than just silver. He had stolen a piece of Mrs. Lancaster's history. I knew what I had to do. I left the apartment, the locket clutched in my hand. It felt heavy, not just from its weight, but from the weight of the burden I carried. I went to Mrs. Lancaster's house, my hand trembling as I rang the doorbell. She opened the door, her face etched with lines of worry and sadness. Mrs. Lancaster, I said, my voice tight. I found this. I held out the locket. She looked at it, her eyes widening. My husband's locket. Where did, where did you find it? I found it in an apartment I was cleaning, I said. I knew it was yours. She took the locket, her fingers tracing the inscription. Thank you, Jane. This means so much to me. She looked at me, her eyes filled with gratitude. I know you tried to warn me about Ethan. I'm so sorry for the way I doubted you. It's okay, I said, my voice choked with emotion. I just wanted to help, and I'm glad I could. She smiled, a genuine, heartfelt smile. You're a good girl, Jane, a good girl kind girl. I walked away from her house, the air feeling lighter, the burden I carried a little less heavy. I still had the memory of Ethan's betrayal, the lingering fear of his presence, but I had done the right thing. I had helped Mrs. Lancaster, and in a small way, I had restored a piece of her past. And that, I realized, was the best Valentine's Day gift I could have ever asked for. The fence needs painting. It's that simple. I've been putting it off for months, but the peeling paint and the chip wood are starting to look like a festering sore on the otherwise perfect facade of my house. I pride myself on keeping things tidy, and this fence is just an eyesore. So. I turned to Craigslist, the ultimate haven for both the desperately seeking and the hilariously questionable. I'm not afraid to admit it, I'm a sucker for a good Craigslist story. You never know what bizarre individual you'll find lurking in the depths of those dusty classifieds ready to offer their services with a smile and a barely concealed air of menace. Today, I found him, a man named Tony. His ad promising quality work at affordable rates. A bit of a red flag, those words. Quality and affordable rarely go hand in hand, especially in the fickle world of home improvement but the picture attached to the ad 
was promising. A young man, maybe in his late twenties, with a charming smile and a physique that suggested he knew his way around a paintbrush. He'll be here tomorrow morning at nine, I told my wife, Marie, as I recounted the conversation. She raised an eyebrow, her skepticism as sharp as a new kitchen knife. You know, you can always just call a professional, she said, someone with a proper license and insurance. Marie, you know I hate dealing with professionals, I countered. They're all about the bottom line, never putting in the extra effort. Tony seems like a good guy. Well, I hope you're right, she said, a hint of worry in her voice. Just be careful, okay? I brushed off her concern. As I said, I'm a sucker for a good Craigslist story. Besides, I'm not that naive. I'm a retired detective, for heaven's sake. I've seen my fair share of shady characters in my time. The next morning, I woke up early, excited for the day ahead. The sun was already high in the sky, casting long, playful shadows across the yard. I was out in the driveway, hosing down the fence, when a beat-up old Ford pickup truck pulled into the driveway. A man emerged, tall and broad-shouldered, with a face that almost looked too youthful for his age. He was wearing a faded t-shirt and worn-out jeans, but his eyes, startlingly blue, held a glint of something unsettling. Tony, I asked, extending a hand. He shook it with a firm grip. Yep, that's me. You the homeowner? I am, I said, feeling a pang of unease. He didn't look like the man in the picture at all, but then he just gained some weight since the photo. Or maybe he stopped shaving. I wanted to run his name through the police database, but decided against it. I didn't want to come across as suspicious. Tony surveyed the fence. He ran a calloused hand across the peeling paint. His expression thoughtful. This is going to be a bit of a job, he said, but I can get it done. You got uh, any particular color in mind? Just something simple, nothing too fancy, I told him. Something that'll match the house. Got it, he said, nodding. I'll need a few days, maybe a week to get it done. Depending on the weather. No problem, I said. Just tell me what you need. I'll be in and out all day, so just let yourself win. I've got some sodas in the fridge. He gave me a quick smile, seemingly unfazed by my suggestion that he make himself at home. He started to gather his supplies. A paint sprayer, a couple of buckets... A small box of tools. It seems like he was more prepared for a full-scale renovation than just a simple fence painting. Then he did something that made my stomach clench. He reached into his truck and pulled out a large, battered duffel bag. He looked around, making sure I wasn't watching. Then he carefully placed the bag behind the fence, concealed by a tangle of overgrown ivy. His face was
was hidden in the shadows, but I could swear I saw a flicker of something sinister in his eyes. I didn't mention it, not wanting to scare him off, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. The next few days were uneventful. Tony seemed to be working diligently, and the fence was starting to look better with each passing day. Marie, however, was still worried. Her skepticism a constant reminder of my own suspicions. He is just a painter, I reassured her. What's the worst that could happen? But I was lying. The worst could happen. I couldn't ignore the bag hidden behind the fence. I couldn't ignore the way Tony would disappear into the woods during the afternoon, returning with his clothes stained with what looked like rust but felt strangely sticky. He seemed to shy away from my gaze, and his once open demeanor was replaced by a guarded silence. I needed to find out what was in that bag. The fourth day, I decided to take a chance. I waited until Tony was out, and then I snuck through the back gate, my heart pounding in my chest. My hand shook as I reached for the bag, my mind conjuring up images of what I might find inside. Tools, weapons, drugs, or something far worse. I unzipped the bag, my breath catching in my throat. It was filled with rags covered in a thick, viscous liquid that smelled faintly of metallic blood. I recoiled, my stomach churning. I rummaged through the bag, finding a chipped ceramic bowl, a set of cleaning supplies, and a small bloodstained notebook. The notebook was filled with entries, scrawled in a hurried, almost panicked hand. They were cryptic, but I managed to decipher them. The job went bad. He fought back. Had to make it quick. Needed to get rid of the body. Tried to use the acid, but it didn't work. Too much flesh, not enough time. The paint will do. It'll all be gone soon. Nobody will find him. My blood ran cold. This wasn't just a simple fence painter. This was a murderer. He was using paint, the very substance he was hired to use, to dispose of his victim. And I, a retired detective, was right there, unwittingly serving as his accomplice. I knew what I had to do. I raced back to the house, my mind racing. I had to call the police, but what could I tell them? A fence painter is using blood as paint to dispose of a body? They'd think I was crazy. I needed proof. I needed to catch Tony in the act. I got back to the house just as Tony was walking through the front door. His face was pale and his eyes were red-rimmed. He seemed exhausted and his movements were sluggish. I'm going to get a burger, I said casually. Want anything? No, I'm good, he said, his voice raspy. He glanced at the paint cans, his gaze lingering on the one labeled red. His eyes flickered to me, the fear in his eyes as clear as the blood on his hands. I knew then that I had him. I know about the bag, I said, my voice calm but steady. Tony froze, 
his eyes widening in terror. He tried to speak, but no words came out. Don't move, I said, my heart pounding in my chest. I'm calling the police. I grabbed my phone, my fingers shaking as I dialed 911. I told the operator what I knew, my voice trembling. I told her about the bag, about the entries in the notebook, about the bloodstained rags, about the way Tony seemed to be trying to dispose of something in the woods. Please hurry, I pleaded, my voice breaking. He's dangerous. It felt like ours, but it was probably just a few minutes before the police arrived. I watched as they apprehended Tony, his face a mask of terror and disbelief. Marie came out, her eyes wide. What happened? she asked. She saw the bloodstained rags, the notebook, and the duffel bag. She saw the look on Tony's face. He's a murderer, I said, my voice hoarse. He was using the paint to get rid of the body. It was a long night. The police questioned me, searched the woods, and eventually found the body. Tony's story was a horrific one, a tale of betrayal and violence, a desperate attempt to cover up his crime. The fence was never finished. It remained half-painted, a silent testament to the dark secret it had hidden. It still stands there, a stark reminder that even in the seemingly mundane, the darkness can lurk, waiting to be revealed. It's a reminder of the hidden dangers, the chilling possibilities, the stories untold. And it's a reminder that sometimes the Craigslist stories are far more sinister than we could ever imagine. It's been almost a year since Grandma passed. A year of quiet evenings with Grandpa. A year of him staring at the same photographs. A year of his laughter fading into a tired sigh. I hate seeing him like this. He's been a shadow of his former self. His vibrant personality dulled by the weight of grief. He's always been a man of actions, not words. He'd fix anything, build anything, solve any problem, but now he just sits, his hands idle, his eyes distant. It's like he lost his spark. The other day, he mentioned something that sent a chill down my spine. A friend he'd met online. An attractive woman named Sarah who had been so kind to him, reaching out and offering him companionship. She's so smart, you know, Grandpa said, a glimmer of his old self returning to his eyes. We talk for hours. She's like a breath of fresh air. He showed me a couple of pictures of Sarah, a young woman, maybe in her late twenties, with piercing blue eyes and a dazzling smile. She looked like nothing like the kind of woman who would be looking for companionship on Craigslist. My stomach 
twisted. I tried to explain, to warn him. Grandpa, Craigslist isn't the safest place to meet someone. It's full of scammers. Maybe she just wants your money. His face softened. She's not like that, David. We talk about everything. She wants to get to know me. Just like I want to get to know her. I couldn't argue. He was so desperately lonely. So eager for connection. I knew I couldn't stop him. Not completely. But I could try to be there for him. To guide him. To keep him safe. July 28th. It's gotten worse. Grandpa has been spending hours with Sarah online, even late into the night. He talks about her constantly, describing her wit, her compassion, her stories about her life. I know I should say something, but I can't bring myself to. I feel like I'm watching him walk into a fire, and I'm powerless to stop him. He started leaving her voicemails, sweet messages about his day, his hopes for the future. He even bought a new laptop, a special one for talking to Sarah, as he put it. He even started calling her my love in his messages. Something is off and it's terrifying. August 15th. Today, Grandpa told me he's sending Sarah money. He said she's trying to get her life back on trap and needs some help. I felt my blood run cold. Grandpa, you can't just send money to someone you've never met. It's a scam. He just shook his head. She's not like that, David. She's genuine. She's my friend. And she needs help. He showed me a picture of a donation website filled with details of Sarah's misfortune. A fire, a car accident, an unexpected medical bill, he was convinced of her sincerity, and I couldn't convince him otherwise. I tried to call the number listed on the website, but it went straight to voicemail. I knew I had to do something. I researched the website, but couldn't find anything. It was like it didn't exist. Later that day, I saw Grandpa packing a suitcase. He said he was going to meet Sarah, finally after weeks of online conversations. I felt a wave of panic wash over me. I had to do something. But what? August 22nd. I followed him. It was the only option. I knew I couldn't let him go alone. He was driving towards a nondescript motel on the outskirts of town. The address Sarah had given him. I watched from a distance, my heart pounding. Finally, he entered the motel. I waited outside, filled with apprehension. An hour passed, two hours, then he came out. His face beaming. He was holding a small bouquet of flowers. She's real, David. She's amazing. We laughed, we talked, and we even, we even danced. He blushed, his eyes sparkling. He was so happy, but something felt wrong. Sarah hadn't come out with him. Where is she, Grandpa? He hesitated, then mumbled. She had to leave early. She said she'd call me later. I pressed him further. 
Why didn't she come out with you? We were waiting. We could have all gone to dinner together. He avoided my gaze. She said she also had to see her sick mother. She's worried about her. I wasn't convinced. Something wasn't right. He was falling deeper into this fabricated web, and I was powerless to stop him. September 10th. Things have spiraled downwards. Grandpa started withdrawing large sums of money from his savings account. For Sarah, he said. He said she needed it for her mother's treatment, for her own bills. He even started selling his belongings. His prized fishing rod, his grandfather clock, his old car. He was liquidating his life piece by piece for a woman he had never truly met. I begged him to stop, to think rationally, but he was lost in his own world. She needs me, David, he said, his voice filled with desperation. I can't let her down. He's become a stranger, a shadow of the man I loved and respected. The vibrant spark in his eyes is gone, replaced by relentless desperation to please a woman he believes desperately to be real. September 25th. He's gone. He sold his house, gave away everything he had, and sent the rest of his savings to Sarah. He said he was going to meet her. For good this time, he told me. He said he was going to start a new life with her. I begged him to come home, to let me help him. But he was so convinced of Sarah's love, so blinded by his own loneliness, that he didn't listen. He left with a single suitcase, his face lit up by the promise of a life he believed was waiting for him. But I knew deep in my gut that Sarah was nothing more than a figment of his lonely imagination. October 1st, I received a call from a social worker. They found Grandpa sleeping on a park bench, his clothes tattered, his face pale. He was disoriented, confused. He didn't recognize me. He mumbled something about Sarah, about a meeting, about a new life. The social worker told me that he'd been sleeping on the streets for weeks, his money gone, his hope shattered. She said he was suffering from a severe case of depression, brought on by the trauma of losing grandma and the emotional manipulation of Sarah.